Now, the newly appointed Kenya National Examinations Council has held its first meeting this morning. Former University of Nairobi Vice Chancellor Professor George Magoha was appointed to act as the chairman of the board on interim basis. The appointment was announced by Education Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi shortly after he dissolved the previous board following complaints over examination irregularities. Several former officials have been grilled by the police. And on that note, we will now take a look at the new formation of the Kenya National Examination Council. Let's just take a look at those who have come into the new board after the former was dissolved. Of course, as I had earlier mentioned, George Magoha is the chairman of the new Kenya National Examination uh, Examination Council board. And members retained from the old board, of course, from the NEC Act, there's a five members of the board that are quote unquote quite untouchable and uh, even as the board was dissolved these are the five that could not be ousted. We have Dr. Belio Kipsang who is the principal secretary of education, Kamau Thuge who is the principal secretary of treasury or for treasury we have Julius Ouma Juan who is the director of the Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development Nancy Masharia who is the teachers service commission secretary and uh, Pius Muticia who is the acting CEO CEO of the Quality Assurance Ministry of Education. These are the five who, according to the Kenya National Act, uh, National Examination uh, Council Act, should be in the board, and uh, three more should be appointed by Cabinet Secretary for Education. And that is the same thing that Dr. Matiangi did. He appointed Martin Osangiri Okio, and uh, Rosemary C. Saina, and Dr. John Onsite. These are the three newest members of the Kenya. National Examination Council Board, making it eight to add up with the five members who are uh, who, who did not who or who were not uh, suspended or ousted from the board. Now the dissolved board. Uh, uh, Education Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi dissolved the Professor Kabiru Kinyanjui, who was the chairman of the board, and ordered the arrest of nine senior Kenya National Examination officials over the 2015 Kenya National Examination uh, mix-up. We had irregularities uh, that got the country and the outside world questioning the credibility of examinations in the country. Let's now take a look at those who are currently currently stand suspended uh, and are undergoing investigations. We have the CEO, Dr. John Joseph Kivilu, who is leading the park, he was among those that Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Olenkaiseri ordered to record statements with the police over the 2015 examination irregularities. We have Ambia Noor, who is the Senior Deputy Secretary for Examination, also asked to record statements with the police. Uh, Maundu Mantezawa, who is the Deputy Secretary for Security. We have Thomas McKenzie, who is the Principal uh, Examination Secretary. Sarah Majani, who is the Senior Deputy Secretary for Reproduction. Graphics, Bobby Nyaga Mwai, who is the Senior Deputy Secretary, Geoffrey Gitogo, who is the Senior Deputy Secretary. We also have Michael Ndua, who is the Principal Secretary for Supply Chain uh, Management Office, and Richard Mwangangi, the Deputy Secretary uh, for the Council or the Board. Uh, these are the nine, uh, just to remind you, these are the nine who currently were ordered by Interior Cabinet Secretary Joseph Olenkaiseri uh, to, uh, uh, to, to write statements or record statements with the police. And this is a story we will definitely be keeping you up to date on as uh, the first board meeting uh, meets today for the Kenya National Examination Council. And still on matters education, we will now be joined by our reporter, Michelle Ngele, who is joining us from Parliament, uh, where Education Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi is currently held up in a meeting with the Parliamentary Education Committee led by their chair, Sabina Shege. Michelle Ngele, what are the latest developments? We understand that the media has been locked out. Absolutely, Akisa. Well, uh, the Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi has actually just stepped out of that uh, meeting with the National uh, Committee on Education. He has, however, refused to give his comments to the media on what they were discussing in there. But Akisa, what I can tell you, after the journalists were locked out, uh, it is a, a very heated, closed-door meeting ensued. 
we were able to get some information from some members of the committee. And one of the issues that they were discussing, um, an issue which the Cabinet Secretary deemed as a very sensitive issue that should be discussed in camera, was the cancellation of the 5,101 results. There was a petition that was filed with the committee that the cancellation of those results be reversed because it was done in uh, without uh, any specific criteria. Now, the uh, petition specifically says that uh, members of the Kenya National Union of Teachers had raised alarm over the workings of the Kenya National Examinations Council prior to the KCSC examination. Now, um, they went, the Ministry of Education went ahead to ignore those concerns for the Kenya National Union of Teachers and went ahead to issue the examinations as they were. So the petition says it is uh, the fault of NEC that those results were released. So they either reversed those 5,101 results that were cancelled or nullified all the results of all the candidates who took part in that examination. But other than that, I think that what was being discussed here was also the massive fraud that has been discovered in the Kenya, uh, Kenya National Examination Council. Um, just this week, the Directorate of Criminal Investigations released a report showing that uh, a cartel of five top officials in NEC has been operating and has been responsible for national examination leakages for years, working together with school principals as well, with the, as, well as the police to offer them um, security while they were doing those um, the, the, the dealing. And that cartel is said to have worked with the full knowledge of the exam body. And so these are issues that the cabinet secretary was answering to in front of the national committee. What I can tell from the meeting here today, however, is that uh, members of the committee themselves are mixed that they are split between um, whether they should nullify the results of the entire examination or whether they should only reverse the council results of the 5,000 candidates, like you said. Now, Michelle, even as uh, we talk, uh, even as we have nine officials from the Kenya National Examination Council uh, recording statements, are we looking at a committee that wants dire consequences for those found guilty, even with the report that you have mentioned on how examinations for the year 2015 were stolen? Absolutely. Well, um, what uh, members of this committee say is that the 5,101 students are being punished alone, but there was an entire cartel of people who are yet to be punished. And so they say whether the results were dirty, the students should be allowed to keep with those results, or the council um, you know, goes ahead and nullifies all the results. The members may have an issue with the fact that those 5,000 results were cancelled on the basis of a recommendation from NEC. And their concern is that you cannot possibly um, take recommendations from NEC, the very same council that has been discredited by the Ministry of Education. Now, so this morning, there was a meeting by the new NEC board discussing the way forward. And uh, it was a closed-door meeting, but uh, some of the issues that were expected to be discussed is whether they would be suspending the members of the dissolved NEC board, um, including the CEO, Joseph Kizilu, and the eight others who are currently ongoing, um, currently facing an ongoing investigation over the exam leakages. And so we're yet to hear what was discussed in that meeting. But uh, if they did choose to suspend those officials, then it means that the board may appoint an acting CEO as investigations are underway. So it was definitely something that was on the agenda for that meeting this morning suspend members of the former network. So Michelle, essentially the uh, National Committee or the Parliamentary Committee on Education is asking for the reversal of the 5,101 students whose uh, examinations were cancelled, examination results were cancelled? Yes, they are. They say that uh, those exams were cancelled on the recommendation of the National Examination Council, but they are asking for the Cabinet Secretary to go beyond that report forward by NEC because that is the same council that has then been discredited for the report that they used. The criteria that they used to cancel those results then was not fair and was not eligible. So they are calling for the reversal and fighting for the results of those 5,101 candidates to ensure that um, they, they don't suffer for that rot that uh, has been going on in fact. Many of them are asking questions, you know, we have a school like Moi University that reported over 300 days and uh, none of the results in that school were cancelled. And so the question being uh, raised here as to the criteria that was used. 
And then again, when you consider the work that has been um, revealed in the Kenya National Examination Council, you find that uh, his top officials running the cartel that has been selling examination material has also been working with school principals from the big schools, and these are the big national and county schools. And so that means that uh, many of these schools were compromised, and uh, that many of the, I mean, the exams were set about in 2012, so that was, uh, you know, five years before, um, 20, I mean, four years before, normally exams should be set three years prior, and so questions are being asked of, uh, you know, what will be done now, what will be the new criteria of setting examination, and what the National uh, Council on Education feels is that the Cabinet Secretary needs to go beyond just uh, dissolving the next board and, uh, you know, putting a new board in place. It needs to have a complete overhaul in, the all, in all the working of the Kenya National Examination Council. Now, of course, uh, Education CS Fred Nakiri has refused to comment and speak to the media, but uh, we are waiting to hear from more of the members of the National Committee on uh, what they thought of that incident. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. That was our reporter, Michelle Ngele, reporting from the Parliament buildings where Education Cabinet Secretary Fred Matiangi has just stepped out of a meeting or uh, concluded a meeting with the Parliamentary Education Committee led by Sabina Shege. And uh, among the things that Michelle Ngele is telling us is that uh, the committee is asking for the reversal of the examination results that were cancelled for 5,101 students in the 2015 Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education Examinations. Michelle will keep vigil at a Parliament and she will be keeping us up to date uh, with the ongoings from there. But moving on, school administrators have been urged to, uh, to engage in dialogue with students to avoid the numerous cases of school strikes. A Chicago Girls National School Principal Lucy Mudoni Kagwidi says involving students in decisions making decision making gives them a sense of ownership of schools, hence creating harmony and understanding. We who are of the old rot, it has not been easy to sit with the students for them to tell us, to reason, and to give them a chance. But where we have been able to give them an opportunity, we have realized that these students have a lot of wealth, a lot of creativity, a lot of ideas. The Chinese government has expressed contentment with the progress of the Standard Gauge Railway project. The chairman of the Standing Committee of China's National People's Congress, NPC, Zhang Dejiang, has said that Kenya's infrastructure expansion through the project would propel the country into a regional business hub. Zhang, who toured the Standard Gauge Railway project in Mombasa, said Kenya has made great strides in infrastructure development that will open up business opportunities for the region. Transport and Infrastructure Cabinet Secretary Dr. James Masharia said that the government has also secured a loan from the Chinese government to support the second phase of the project. Masharia said that the development of Phase 2A and the construction, which will commence by the end of the year 2016, will cost $1.5 billion Chinese government has financed the first phase of the standard gauge railway from Mombasa to Nairobi at the tune of $3.8 billion. Successful and we shall be able to deliver the project ahead of time. We have calculated that uh, upon completion this project will contribute at least 1.5 percent increase in GDP in gross domestic project. As you can see, it is transforming the port of Mombasa.
Kajedo County politicians have been blamed over last week's incident in which two people were killed over Imbirikani land dispute. Politicians were accused of inciting locals leading to the deaths of one Masai Moran and a police officer during a confrontation over the Imbirikani land. Some members of the community are opposed to leasing off the 5,000-acre ranch to Bamburi Cement Company. The Kajedo South residents also held a peaceful demo to protest the leasing of the ranch. Kajado Governor David Nkadiane has called for action against all the inciters. Members of American wote wamesema hatutaki. Na tungeomba serikali. Tungeomba serikali. Ni watu wangapi wanasema kwamba hatutaki kukodesha shamba? Hebu ili wapa mikono. Hebu ili wapa mikono. Ningependa tu waone. Sio mimi nimesema, members of American wamesema na hiyo ndiyo msimamo wetu. From Kajedo County, let's now head over to neighboring Uganda, where engineers in Uganda have built Africa's first bus powered by the sun. The Kayola, uh, a, a 35-seater white bus, travels up to 80 kilometers on two power banks that are recharged by solar panels installed on the roof of the bus. KTN's Joy Dorin Bira reports. <laughs> Africa's first solar-powered bus that runs on portable batteries instead of fuel was recently unveiled by engineers from Uganda's Kira Motors Corporation. The bus, dubbed Kayola, uses two batteries charged using solar panels fitted on the vehicle roof and the vehicle can travel a distance of up to 80 kilometers, completing a trip to the country's international airport in Entebbe and back to the capital Kampala on full charge. According to Kira Motors Corporation, the engineers behind the great innovation. The prototype was built by over six staff with 12 engineers and artisans and mass production begins in 2018. The Kayola solar bus is the first electric and later on solar bus to be built in Africa. What makes this bus pretty different is that from the ordinary buses we have on the road today is that it's an electric bus. It's a battery electric vehicle meaning that we use energy stored in batteries as charge, which is converted into mechanical energy by a motor, which is multiplied by a transmission to give us the propulsion we need at the differential unit. So this particular bus has uh, an architecture, a powertrain architecture, which provides for a primary and secondary energy storage. That solar power has massive potential in Africa is no doubt. In fact, one UN study estimated the world's electricity needs could be generated by harvesting solar power from an area of the Sahara 800 kilometers by 800 kilometers. In 2014, a report by the International Energy Agency said the CERN could, with a radical shift in investments, be the world's largest source of electricity by the year 2050, ahead of fossil fuels, wind, hydro, and nuclear. This solar bus, dubbed Kayola, produces no fumes since it runs on clean energy, less noise, and less vibrations are also felt while on board. Clean technology for propulsion is one of the top advantages of what comes with this vehicle as opposed to that. But also, in terms of running the bus, uh, to charge this bus fully, you're going to consume uh, 75 uh, kilowatt hours. And 75 kilowatt hours are about 750. If you do the math there, we are in the neighborhood of just, uh, just over 50,000 shillings to give you 80 kilometers and a range extension of 12 in a day. So when you try to compare that with your diesel, you're seeing that... Uh, Operating-wise, uh, this bus will be more energy efficient. This bus, built by over 60 staff with 12 major engineers and artisans, is set to create employment for thousands of Ugandans once more buses are powered and operations start on various routes. The current cost for one bus is 58,000 U.S. dollars. 
A World Health Organization survey shows that the motor industry is the main source of air pollution across Africa, indirectly leading to loss of lives of over 176,000 people each year on the continent. Joy Doreen Bira, KTN News. Now, issues of religious intolerance and the plight of human rights defenders dominated this year's Human Rights Council meeting at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. Human rights groups Haki Africa received a special invitation to participate in the event where they made contribution on the status of human rights activism in Kenya. We will now link up with the executive director of Haki Africa, Hussein Halid, to speak to us about some of the resolutions that were made in the conference. Hussein Halid, many thanks for joining us uh, on our news program. And quickly, let's get into it. What were some of the highlights of this event? Um, thank you so much for having me and for this opportunity to speak about uh, the Human Rights Council meeting that we got an opportunity to attend. Um, it was uh, a very big meeting, as you can imagine, we had representatives from um, all over the world. And uh, basically we were discussing matters related to religious freedom and rule of law. And uh, the message is that uh, for us to have global peace, for us to have global security, it's paramount for us to ensure that there is cohesion, there is understanding between different religions in the world. So the meeting was very, very clear that for us to ensure that uh, security prevails within our borders, within our countries, we have to use every avenue available to us to promote uh, inter-religious dialogue for purposes of ensuring religious uh, cohesion and understanding at the same time. Currently, uh, where would you put the world? Are we heading into the right direction when it comes to religious tolerance and cohesion, of course? I think uh, if we look across the world currently, we can see that uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, misunderstandings on religious issues. In many parts of the world, we are seeing uh, different faiths uh, getting into conflicts, uh, wars and things like that. But uh, we cannot all say that uh, hope is lost. I think uh, the way the United Nations and uh, state parties uh, of the United Nations are doing some wonderful work to try and address the many issues that are actually prevailing around uh, religious freedom. And uh, we also have civil society organizations, the corporate sector, and everyone who is working together to try and ensure that uh, we attain peace in this world. So I would say currently it might appear as if uh, there are many conflicts, uh, religious conflicts across the world, but we know for a fact that many people are working behind the scenes, particularly uh, religious leaders and state parties, to address uh, the conflicts that are currently being seen everywhere in the world. So the future looks bright, but we need to work extra hard to ensure that we attain the peace that we are all yearning for. Now, Hossein, getting back into the country, uh, Haki Africa is one of the most vocal human rights groups, and we have we've had you. Uh, uh, at, at loggerheads with the government, We've, you've had your accounts frozen and unfrozen and quite a number of times. Where does that place Haki Africa right now? I think uh, the experience of Haki Africa is what many other civil society groups and institutions are going through across the world. Even the experience of Kenyan government, particularly in addressing uh, uh, civil society issues, is not something new to Kenya alone. This is happening across the world. We are in a process where we are trying to find our way out. And uh, for particularly a country like Kenya, the war against terrorism is not something that we have been used to. Uh, for, for very long. It's something new to us. Uh, His Excellency the President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta uh, lamented about this some time back and uh, asked the international community to assist. For example, the case of uh, Haki Africa, the freezing and unfreezing of the accounts, it's an issue that was shrouded with a lot of misunderstanding, uh, half-truths here and there, and now we are able to actually confirm that we are all working towards the attainment of the same goal. So we are now back um, in, in good books. We are working with government authorities. We are working with state parties to ensure that we actually understand what is happening and work together to promote peace. So civil society 
is actually supposed to complement the work of the government. Government should not see or view civil society as an entity that is working against it. So when we are able to work together, then we are able to attain the peace that our people are really uh, yearning for. And we believe that we are in the right cause at this point in time. Last year we made uh, some, uh, uh, we had some issues that we've been able to resolve now. And we believe that uh, in the coming few years, we should be able to actually achieve our goal, both as civil society and as uh, government. Uh, Hussein, the issue of radicalization, among the issues or the reasons that were given uh, to freeze and unfreeze your, yes. account or your accounts, and why Haki Africa was targeted is because uh, it was accused of supporting terror and radicalization. But what is the contribution of the civil society in the country, specifically your group, when it comes to help fighting radicalization among the youth? Um, thank you very much. I think the role of civil society, Haki Africa, and many other groups on the ground is to ensure that uh, human rights are promoted and protected. Um, you see, it's not Haki Africa that uh, wrote the constitution and gave it to Kenyans. It's something that all Kenyans actually voted for. And in August 2010, we promulgated the new constitution that actually has the Bill of Rights as the biggest chapter in that constitution. This basically means that if we are truly uh, to deliver on that constitution, we all have to play our part. And what Haki Africa does is actually play that part of promoting and protecting the rights that are enshrined in the constitution. Again, the constitution that all Kenyans supported for. So when we speak up against the rights of suspects, when we speak up against, I mean, not against, for the rights of suspects, when we speak up for the rights of victims, when we speak up for the rights of individuals and communities, we are not saying that out of our own making, but we are actually asking that the constitution that we all support and agree to should actually be respected. So it's a misunderstanding um, in most cases where people feel that when you speak for the rights of arrested persons, which is actually in the constitution of Kenya itself, they tend to imagine that you're actually defending uh, criminals or you're defending suspects. And that is not the case. What we are saying is that any society that treats the vulnerable, that treats the weak, that treats the poor in a bad manner is a society that actually needs to relook at its values and principles. And these are the issues that we actually raise in terms of addressing human rights, not just of the rich, the poor, and those who are on the right track, but also of those who are weak and vulnerable. And that is our work as human rights uh, organizations. And uh, Kenya today has one of the strongest civil societies in Africa. And what we need to do is actually support their growth to support their work so that we can all have a society that is a just society. The issue of radicalization and the war on terror, uh, uh, was it part of the conference in Geneva? And if so, mm -hmm. what are some of the resolutions that came out regarding the same? Yes, the war against terror and radicalization and extremism currently is an issue that features in all global meetings. You actually can't go to any forum wherever it is, without these issues coming to the fore. So when I attended the Human Rights Council meeting, and uh, we were speaking about religious freedom and tolerance and, uh, you know, unity amongst different faiths, we actually discussed some of these concerns. And the concern was that uh, the war against terror is actually used to justify human rights violations across the world. And uh, being a recognized uh, institution, a human rights institution that is actually working at the grassroots, it was an opportunity for us to also explain or to make our input from the Kenyan perspective on how we can actually use religious freedom to guarantee people their rights. So at the Human Rights Council meeting, we actually spoke about a project that was being supported by the Canadian High Commission here in Kenya to promote dialogue between persons of different faiths. Um, in the last couple of months, uh, we've been bringing people from the Hindu community, from the Muslim community, from the Christian community to actually sit down and address the small differences that actually play themselves so hugely in a manner that causes a an, an misunderstanding. So we were able to discuss about this and explain to the people how we've managed to promote tolerance in Mombasa, in Kenya, in order for us to move forward as a country, as one nation.
Now, Hussein, the war against the terror and the violation of human rights, which you say is justified uh, to do the latter, where do we draw the line? Time again. The war on terror, as you have said, uh, is perceived to uh, uh, to ensure that human rights yes. violations uh, are breached or human rights are breached. Where do we draw the line on, yes, we are fighting terror, but again, we are not undermining yes. human rights in the world? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, that's a very, very good question. And I think it's an issue that many countries are trying to answer at the moment and to address uh, specifically. Um, recently, um, the United Nations General Ban Ki-moon issued guidelines on um, human rights respect, I mean, respecting human rights in the fight against terror. We know that it's not an easy task for security authorities and for others to ensure uh, security at the same time as uh, protect and promote human rights. But nevertheless, that must be the way in which we carry out the fight against terrorism. Fight against terrorism should not turn us also into terrorists because the moment we employ the same strategies of harassment, of torture, of killings, we quite lost him there. As he says, uh, Hussein Halid, the executive director of Haki Africa, was privileged to attend the 31st United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, a session that says uh, is out to promote religious tolerance in the world, discussions on radicalization of the youth and the war against terror. Now, a section of members of the Bomet County Assembly have revived calls for impeachment of Governor Isaac Ruto on grounds of corruption and and a gross misconduct. The governor is this afternoon set to address a press conference from Bomet, accompanied by over 20 MCAs who are opposed to his ouster. Speaker of the Bomet County Assembly had last week suspended the tabling of the motion to allow the MCA leading the impeachment drive to table sufficient evidence on the governor's alleged gross misconduct. The motion will now be tabled on Thursday this week. Joining us now is our political reporter Duncan Haemba at our city center studios just to help us delve into the issue of impeachment of governors. Haemba, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, what are we looking at? Is Isaac Ruto... Uh, Will he be able to survive this? The number of MCS who are against his impeachment, and those ones that are said to be pushing for his impeachment, uh, we are told they are around 14, 15 there. So I don't think the motion will fly. Because when you look at even the issues that are being raised and, of course, the way the governor will address or has been addressing the issue is actually said that it's purely on vendetta. Then again, looking at the time that we have between now and 2017. So it's too late in the day. Maybe that is the reason why, as it stands, it has very few number of MCS that are pushing for his impeachment. So from our own assessment or from where I stand and what many political pundits are saying, uh, it's likely to flop at uh, even before it takes off uh, on era. Remember, this comes uh, barely a fortnight after we saw Isaac Ruto rigorously campaign for uh, Kanu, uh, uh, Kanu uh, Paul Sang, who tried uh, or contested for the Kericho senatorial by-election. There was a tight battle between Kanu and Jab. Could this have an external hand in politics? Yes, that is what many are saying. Uh, many believe that actually it's not genuine that uh, they, they, they could have been involved in whatever is being alleged. But many are reading a political uh, hand in this. We remember that uh, before even the Kericho senatorial uh, by-election, there was a by-election in Bomet County, the Nyangore's ward, and you know what actually transpired. He went there, came with uh, a little known party that was barely, I think, a month old. And yes, as it stands, there is a new 
new member of uh, County Assembly in the Bomet County Assembly in the name of uh, Mashinani Development Party, uh, uh, MCA. So, of course, he must have rubbed the uh, URP wing or the t Jubilee wing wrong way. And for him to have uh, won that uh, seat, clearly that is some of uh, may what maybe he'll say that uh, is being fought against uh, on such grounds. But when you look at even how that uh, MCA was voted in in the Bomet County, again, it tells you that maybe there are people who are thinking that the governor could be politically right in some aspects. So clearly, he, he will. I think he will look at it from uh, that Nyangore's ward by election and uh, to some extent the Kericho by election, uh, Akisa. Now, this is not the first time uh, MCAs have tried to impeach a governor. We've seen since in Makweni, we've seen Embu and uh, some parts of uh, central Kenya. What does this really say about the relationship between governors and MCAs and even senators in the devolved governments? When you look at other county assemblies, maybe if we might cite, uh, for instance, Embu and Makweni, uh, you could say there were issues that were coming up and that were not politically related. But when you look at uh, how the Kericho one uh, flopped and the attempts that have been there to impeach the Bomet one, clearly you could say there is a political hand in it or they are political in nature, not necessarily tied to the allegations that are being uh, thrown around. Of course, the uh, top on the list, there will be issues that they have not done this, done that. But when you look at Bomet and Kericho, the two governors, they've been branded as uh, renegades within the Jubilee wing and more so leading the rebellion in the South Rift. So uh, to a large extent, that those areas have been largely political. So you cannot say it's the same case that has happened in uh, Embu and uh, an attempt in Makweni County. So for Kericho and Bomet, purely it's a uh, political, uh, if we might, if it's correct to say that political vendetta is what is at play. So there is a clear uh, line when you look at the attempts in other counties and this particular county. So for, for Bomet, as we speak, uh, it's largely political, and as I said, I don't think it will be going anywhere. And maybe look at it this way: even if it was to pass, if there was that, um, uh, if the motion was to pass, and then the process of the impeachment gets underway, and maybe it lands in the Senate. Uh, again, it cannot get anywhere, as it stands in terms of numerical composition in the Senate. The Code Alliance has 28, uh, 28 senators on uh, under its fold. Then the Jubilee has 31. Assuming that uh, the committee that will uh, probe the governor uh, doesn't agree, and therefore it calls for a vote on the floor of the Senate, and then as it stands, code 28 Jubilee 31, again it will flop. Why will it flop? The Jubilee wing already, as it stands with 31, has uh, 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 likes of Senator Boni Halole of Kakamega. Of course, we know where he's pledging his allegiance. It has uh, Viga Senator George Haniri. Of course, we know where he's pledging his allegiance as well. And then it has now the real Kanu uh, 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 senators, that is uh, Gideon Moy and uh, Lonyangapo. Those are four. So if it was to be put on a vote where all the 47 uh, senators are supposed to vote, then, of course, with 31 and 28, now it will uh, swing in the favor of uh, code, which, of course, will stand by, will have to, will not have Jubilee have their way. So there is nowhere the, the motion or even the impeachment, even if it gets to the Senate, will have to fly a case. And back to Bomet, are we seeing a scenario where this impeachment motion against Isaac Ruto is likely to fuel more rebellion against the Jubilee Alliance party? Yes, and as we speak, I've just been uh, engaging a political pundit on the ground and they were saying that uh, lobbying is ongoing particularly uh, because when they realize that uh, those ones that are pushing for his impeachment, the numbers are too small, uh, uh, already the number they were told that those who have signed are now 15, while those who, that are opposed to the motion are 12. So Bomet has a total of 35 MCS. And now when you look at... Um, uh, those ones that are opposed to the motion are 12, then those are that have signed are 15. Anything can happen and there's a lobbying and perhaps those 15, it could easily uh, uh, go the other way around. Plus, we know what happens. There are people who sign, but when it comes to actual voting, then it uh, happens the other way around because perhaps you are those ones that say they sign under duress. So as it stands to, uh, 15 against 12, uh, that makes 27.
from 35, we are looking at 8. So those 8 should go the other way around. But what we are uh, assured is that uh, majority are looking at it like it's late in the day. So I don't think that it will be actually flying uh, from uh, the perspective that we are getting from various uh, uh, sources on the ground. Thank you very much, Duncan, for that, uh, for those insights. That is our political reporter, Duncan Haemba, joining us from the city center studio. Uh, putting into perspective the impeachment motion against Bomet County Governor Isaac Ruto, and as he says, lobbying is currently going on to see if uh, Bomet County Governor Isaac Ruto's impeachment motion will actually go through in the county assembly or not. That is something to watch out for, and Duncan Haimba will be keeping us up to date with that. Now, the Kenya Railways has invited bids for an advisor to help identify an operator for the new standard gauge railway network. The massive infrastructure project is aimed at boosting trade and cutting transport costs across the East African region. This comes as the project nears its completion between Mombasa and Nairobi. The 138 billion shilling standard gauge railway project, which began in December 2014, is almost coming to its completion, linking Kenya's Indian Ocean port of Mombasa to the capital Nairobi, then to Uganda. In a paid newspaper advertisement, the state-run Kenya Railways indicated the advisor will recommend the appropriate operating model for the railway that is currently under construction. You are aware it is the most important project ever that taken by government of Kenya. In fact, not just government of Kenya, but uh, the entire region of Eastern and Central Africa. The new Chinese-funded railway line is expected to ferry heavy and bigger containers much faster and reduce pressure on the region's road, which have been damaged by heavy traffic and uneven maintenance. Railway means so much for us, and that's why as a government we are so committed to make sure it's fully successful. It's successful, not just phase one, because phase one is good, but it's not complete without the, port, without the railway going all the way to Malaba. The new railway is expected to open up to commercial services in the mid-2017. The existing meter gauge railway line was built by the British at the turn of the century and is in a bad shape due to years of mismanagement and neglect. Because from Mobasa, this is a first phase arriving in Nairobi, but for Nairobi, it will go to Naivasha, then take a southern route, go to Narok, go to Bomet, Nyamira, and then Kisumu. Kenya also hopes to transform its passenger service. Now plagued by delays, the new line will cut the journey time between Nairobi and Mombasa to four and a half hours from more than 13 hours now. Philip Keitan, KTN Business. Cabinet Secretary for Lands, Professor Jacob Kaimeni, says some parcels of land along the standard gauge railway line in Mombasa were fraudulently acquired. Kaimeni says three parcels measuring 60 hectares were compulsorily acquired by the government in the year 1974 to be used to set up industries. For details now, we join our senior reporter, Patrick Amimo, on phone from the Parliament buildings. Patrick, give us, a, give us an update on the issue of lands raised by uh, Lands Cabinet Secretary Jacob Kaimeni. Uh, thank you so much. Indeed, uh, this particular uh, land in, in question, uh, the Cabinet Secretary has said that uh, uh, he wants those investigating agencies like the CID, Director of Criminal Investigation, to move in and see whether these particular parcels of land about, um, these are six parcels of land measuring about um, 100, uh, 110 acres. Uh, or in, in other words, 60 hectares. And this particular uh, parcel of land is in, in, in Mombasa County, that is in Changama area of Mombasa County, near the near uh, about 600 meters from the from the rail line. And it's the subject that is being um, this parcel of land are being uh, investigated on how they were acquired. Because according to the ministry, they were uh, a forgery. Uh, these uh, the titles were a forgery, and they are trying to look at it. How how, how come that uh, the National Land Commission also issued a letter uh, letter of allocation to this parcel of land? The land initially, uh, according to the to the Cabinet Secretary, was acquired by the government way back in 1974, and it was to be it was meant for construction of industries. 
No, the, the, the industries have not been established to date in that particular parcel of land. Uh, but now with the with the railway, <coughs> given that the land is close to the railway line, uh, they want they, they are trying to see whether it is part of the land that uh, uh, owners want to, to be compensated for. And if that that be if that should be the case, then uh, the ministry says that these uh, parcels of land are a forgery. And because the, the land belongs to, to the government. It was, uh, one, this was one of the issues that the, the minister did, uh, did, did uh, address before the uh, National Assembly's uh, uh, Committee on Lands. Uh, the other issue that uh, also the minister, uh, Cabinet Secretary, did tackle was to do with, uh, <coughs> sorry, with a parcel of land belonging to, uh, to a, a cooperative society that's called, uh, it's called Kingena Farmers Cooperative Society, uh, formerly known as Ndiyama Cherungut and Partners. It's in Tonzoya County. It's a land measuring 1,800 acres. Uh, this land was bought by uh, was bought in 1971 from the Agricultural Development Corporation, and uh, but in 19 uh, after the owners paid 200,000 shillings, but uh, apparently uh, uh, the African Agricultural Development Corporation did not uh, uh, did not give out this particular land. Uh, instead, it, it also gave the land allocated it to, to the Ministry of Natural Resources uh, without explaining to the owners on what what transpired. And also, uh, the minister says uh, these owners uh, those are. Uh, uh, of Kangema, Kangena Farmers Cooperative Society were not compensated or given an alternative land. So this particular, the minister has said that uh, this particular ADC is, uh, is also guilty and it has a case to answer uh, because uh, the claimants never received the full amount of money made to this land in 1971 when they acquired, uh, when they bought this particular land and neither has an alternative land been given to them. So the, uh, the minister says wants parliament to revoke, uh, to the Gazette, a notice that was issued way back, uh, that is Gazette Notice Number 2479 of 1978. Uh, the minister says that it should be, that Gazette Notice should be, revo um, that, that notice should be degazetted and that uh, land surrendered to government. And also now, it is also said that the National Land Commission should start the process of returning the land to these bona fide members of this particular Kangena, uh, Kangena cooperative land. And Thank you very also, much. And also that uh, there is a uh, minute and ADC should these uh, they should compensate this they co compensate these Kangena cooperative farmers in full or find alternative land for them. So those are the issues that uh, the community sector uh, uh, handled before the committee. Very much, uh, Patrick, for keeping for giving us that update on uh, the land along the Standard Gauge Railway Line. Patrick Amimo joining us uh, from uh, Parliament, uh, keeping us up to date. Where uh, Cabinet Secretary for Lands, uh, Jacob Kaimenya, has said some parcels of land, about 60 hectares, uh, were fraudulently acquired, and he has been raising this with the Parliamentary Lands Committee. A story that Amimo will be keeping us up to date with, and and of course that wraps it up for us. Many thanks for joining us on KT. And news desk. My name is Akisa Wandera. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and keep it KTN News. KTN News. Get the whole story. We'll deal with it. But uh, I don't have time to waste. And I want them to know that I don't have time to waste. It's, it's very wrong for anyone to assume that they can use the privileges given to parliamentarians. They uttered those words I have found out in a chat that I have a militia and I will deal with it outside here. So we'll see them in court in a couple of days. You know that we don't run militias in Kenya. It is illegal to have militias. So truly speaking, that, that's not a question you should be asking me. And you guys have seen me many years. Have you ever seen me with militia? You know, why would I have a militia and for what purpose? These are kicks of a dying horse, political, people who are headed for political dustbins. That's, where, that's when they start yapping such stories. They should come to the ground and work. If you think I have militias, just go to the police and report. Take a no-b number. Kapoko has militias. Let's deal with it. Why would I have militias? I don't have militias. I have people with me. The issue of militia is not here, neither here nor there. They are wasting public funds. 
then we should actually cite them for wasting public money. I don't think the Mashmua Kamama has time for that rubbish. But if they invite me, we will deal with it. I may not go, because I don't think they have the capacity to intimidate me. I'm not easy. Kamama is not one of those things you think you can intimidate easily. You need a lot of effort and energy to intimidate me. Amepotezwa na mbeberu kwa kukonganisha wao upande huu na mwongozo wa Afrika usiwe kufuata ule wa wa koloni lakini tusingatie mizizi yetu mimi na rafiki yangu Yoweri Mseveni ni rafiki na kutoka sisi kwenda chini Bas lazima muwe pia marafiki. Kitu chochote ambacho kinaweza kudhuru wananchi wa pande huu ama wananchi wa pande ule lazima uzimwe ama kubasha habari maofisa wa pande zote mbili. Hiyo itawawezesha nyinyi kufanya biashara ya kila aina. This is KTN News. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on KTN News. My name is Akisa Wandera. KTN News truck begins now. 20 people are currently admitted at Sekuru Hospital suffering from diarrhea and vomiting complications. The patients are from Kitayoni village and are suspected of drinking contaminated water. Mwingi North Member of Parliament John Munuve, who visited the patients in hospital, says water samples in the area will be taken to government chemists for testing to ascertain whether it is fit for human consumption or not. The MP is now accusing the Kitui County government of not operationalizing Kaningo dispensary, which would have helped to save the child. He now wants the supplier of the unclean water probed. <laughs> A section of members of the Bomet County Assembly have revived the calls for impeachment of Governor Isaac Ruto on grounds of corruption and gross misconduct. The governor is this afternoon set to address a press conference from Bomet, accompanied by over 20 MCAs who are opposed to his ouster. Speaker of the Bomet County Assembly had last week suspended the tabling of the motion to allow the NCA leading the impeachment drive to table sufficient evidence on the governor's alleged gross misconduct. The motion will now be tabled on Thursday this week. <laughs>